Hello and welcome to episode number 292 of the Armin Show podcast, where it is always interesting, informative, and it gets you to a new place in your life through some form of understanding. On this episode, we have from the land of UC Berkeley, it is Professor John Hart of the Hart Lab at Berkeley. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to have you on here. One of the coolest things for me is that when I look at an individual, I look at like their research, for example, for researchers, and then all the people they have worked with or who they manage or guide. Can you tell us a bit about the Heart Lab, all the people who are currently involved in that, and the people of the past that you have influenced through that? Sure. Um, the uh, I've ha I've had a total in my career of 44 doctoral students, students who did their PhD research under my direction. Mm -hmm. uh, I am uh, now sort of semi-retired, and so the Heart Lab group has uh, is smaller than it used to be. At its peak, I had a, about one or two postdoctoral fellows. These are folks who already have their PhD, and about 10 PhD students. More recently, I have uh, uh, shrunk the size of the group down to a much smaller um, because of my semi-retirement status. The students who I've trained over the years have gone on to an amazing variety of careers. Uh, a number of them are now professors at universities, uh, many of them in uh, either departments of biology doing ecological work or in new interdisciplinary programs that are um, more like the program that I teach in at Berkeley. The um, students have also gone on to uh, non-academic jobs. Uh, one is uh, vice president of the World Wildlife Fund Another was uh, vice president of the Santa, uh, of the uh, Nature Conservancy. Yet another student uh, is the director of research at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. So I've had students who have gone into administrative positions as well as academic positions. And they're all doing wonderful things. And uh, they're all much smarter than I am and doing great research or great activist work, uh, making the world a better place. This is cool. The person who says they are all, all much smarter than I am, it's usually inverted in life. That's the smart person, okay? Don't be fooled on this planet. That's pretty good. The director of research at Santa Fe Institute, I like the Santa Fe Institute. I've spoken with many individuals related to there or who are there. Uh, who's that individual and do you like the Santa Fe Institute? Jennifer Dunn. Okay. Did you meet her? I have she, not met Jennifer Dunn. She's vice president for research and um, really head of the faculty at, at the Santa Fe Institute. Do you like that institute? Do you like the ideas behind it? What's your experience with that? I do. I've, uh, I typically spend one to three weeks every year at SFI. And uh, it's kind of a, one of my two homes away from home. Uh, Santa Fe Institute um, is a place where I've um, uh, given many lectures, uh, organized and participated in workshops, um, and uh, I very much miss not being able to go there this year. It's been, I was planning to be there for two weeks in May, but because of COVID, uh, we had to cancel. And in fact, the Santa Fe Institute currently is not um, taking visitors. They're waiting until the pandemic is over. Um, the other home away from home for me is a place called the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory in Colorado. And it's a field station up at uh, nearly 10,000 foot elevation on the western slope of the Colorado Rockies. And I've been going there for the past 44 summers, except not this most recent summer <laughs> because of, um, of COVID. So 
that's that's also a um, it's a place where I do a lot of my field research in ecology. Mm -hmm. That is decades, folks, for people. That yeah. is a long time, and it makes sense that the research has to be done in person, out there, in the field. I remember I spoke with John Marsleff in Washington, and he would just be gone to the field for two months and then come back. Yeah, I would typically spend June, July, and August at the field station. That is pretty cool. Now, what are some of the goals of the Heart Lab, and do they come from your thoughts of what is valuable to research? Is there like combining with others and their goals? How does it come out? What the goals are for the lab? That's a complicated question uh, because there, it, it changes over. It's changed over the years, and uh, it's not at any given time. I usually have different goals with for different students, but um, my general approach is to suggest to new students who come to join my research group some broad areas of research that I am really currently excited about, which can change over time, but at any given time. And then I ask them to try to think about what area interests them. And then we work together to formulate a question or a set of questions that they can answer for their graduate degree. And typically what the problem students have is they want to do too much. They believe their PhD thesis will be a, a earth shaking piece of research. And I try to disabuse them of that and to get them to do something that's doable, that's interesting, that they enjoy and uh, get it done and get out and uh, get a real job and do some exciting work in the real world. Um, that's been my general philosophy with students. The um, thing I, when students say, you know, I don't know what I should work on. And I always say the first thing to think about is, what is it that keeps you awake at night thinking about? And what are you excited about? Where's your, what is your uh, passion? Uh, for research and that generally leads them to uh, a good direction. Uh, the worst thing you can do in graduate school if you're a beginning student is carve out a problem that you're not really interested in, that you're not excited about, but that you think is important. If you think it's important, but you're not excited about it, you're probably gonna have a miserable three or four or five years uh, working on it. So the first and most important thing is to figure out what what you what excites you. And it doesn't have to be the most important problem in the world. It has to be a problem that you're interested in. And then students will do great work. Um, the substantive goals have changed a lot. Back in the 1970s, uh, we were doing a whole lot of work on acid rain and acid snow and how it was affecting uh, populations of uh, aquatic uh, organisms like plankton and uh, also some uh, amphibians like salamanders. And so in the 70s and into the 80s, we were doing a tremendous amount of work. Uh, almost all my students were involved one way or another in studying acid rain. Uh, where's it coming from? Who's producing it? How does it get transported through the atmosphere? And what damage does it do to, bio, uh, to ecosystems when it falls on the ground? Um, then we got interested in the mid 80s in climate change. And so late 80s and on through the 90s and into uh, uh, this century, uh, there's been an enormous amount of work on global warming. And the thing we did up at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab was to set up in the late 1980s what turns out to be the first and longest running climate warming experiment in the world. 
uh, we artificially heated a large area of a subalpine meadow with overhead electric heaters. And then we, we set them to a rate that would simulate the climate we expected around the year 2050. So we were getting a preview of global warming by heating big patches of ecosystem um, to a level that corresponded roughly to what people projected then uh, would be the case 70 years later. Um, and those experiments ran for about 30 years and they provided an enormous amount of insight into how climate change affects ecosystems. Uh, 12 PhD students did their doctoral dissertation just on that experiment. So it provided lots of opportunities. Over 100 undergraduates got field research training working with me on that project. And we learned a lot about uh, how plants respond to climate change, uh, evolutionary adaptation. We learned about nutrient uh, cycles and how uh, the flow of nitrogen and carbon are influenced by climate change. And one of the important things we discovered is that there are very large and uh, uh, worrisome processes. We call them feedbacks. And it works like this. The climate change affects the ecosystem, but in response, the ecosystem does things like release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere because of the climate warming. Now, carbon dioxide is a major cause of global warming. And so the feedback that occurs when you heat the ecosystem and it releases carbon dioxide makes for even more climate warming. And that's, that's a very concerning, uh, very worrisome process because it means global warming will be worse than we had thought it was gonna be because ecosystems are actually gonna respond in a way that makes it worse. There's an effect on itself and then it's yeah. an exponential kind of. Exactly, it's a, it's a vicious cycle that right. um, uh, we discovered through empirical work in the field. Now people had made talked about it. There were mathematical models that had been built that uh, try to incorporate some of these effects, but we really didn't know much about what it would actually look like in nature. And right. experiments like this allow you to get a um, a, a real uh, visceral sense of what these feedbacks look like and uh, the, their strength and um, the direction. There can also be good feedbacks. You could have a warming ecosystem suck up more carbon from the atmosphere. And some ecosystems will do that. But what we discovered is that there were large um, areas on the earth where this kind of uh, destructive feedback occurs. You never know the full details until you actually do a representation of it. You can have assumptions, but you always leave something out. That's something that's true always in life. You always leave a couple of details out. And then when that's you try right. something, oh, this affected this. And this is not so bad, but actually this. One thing, going back to acid rain, actually, that you mentioned earlier, yeah. it came to my mind, what are the like worst features of acid rain? And when are they most extreme, like in a regular city environment? Yeah. The um, acid rain has an effect on life on Earth that will vary tremendously from place to place. And the reason is there are many areas on Earth where the soil and the bedrock are produced from limestone and where you have calcareous um, uh, uh, minerals in the soil that actually neutralize the acids. And those areas are protected. A lot of deserts, for example, have this kind of built-in protection. Uh, but then there are other areas that are very sensitive. And it turns out that 
some of the first places on earth where acid rain damage was seen, like Scandinavia and uh, in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State, those areas have very little calcareous material in the soil, and the systems are therefore extremely sensitive. Now, it turns out here in California, the Sierra Nevada are extremely sensitive to acidity. They're, the bedrock is granite, which does not neutralize acid. And so when acid rain falls in the Sierra or in the mountains of Scandinavia or in the Adirondacks, what happens is the lakes become acidic and the streams become acidic. And then that kills organisms that live in those water bodies. So aquatic ecosystems are extremely sensitive in certain parts of the world. Now, the work we did was interesting because it, we carried it out in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, where there's a mix. You can find a place where there's nothing but quartzite or granite, and therefore very sensitive to acidity. But then you can walk a quarter mile, and you're in an area where there's a seam of limestone, and the lakes there will be protected from acidity. So we were able to find a location that was like a natural laboratory with a variety of different types of bedrock, of geology. And because of the complex geology, we had lakes right nearby each other, which differed by factors of 10 or 100 in their sensitivity to acidity. So we were able to use those differences as controls because everything else was the same about those lakes. They were getting the same amount of uh, tourism and um, uh, land use effects and uh, other disturbances. So we were able to sort of make use of um, the natural variety of rock types to create controlled uh, experimental results. And th that proved very interesting. We were able to show that a very unusual population of salamanders was becoming endangered because of acidity. And that work reached the attention of uh, the senator from Colorado, uh, Tim Wirth. He's a senator in Washington, but elected from Colorado at the time. Yeah. And he was a very uh, you know, passionate environmentalist and a very able legislator. So back in the 80s, he uh, was responsible for writing the amendments to the Clean Air Act. Uh, oh. And those amendments, because of, partly because of our work, included uh, sources of acid rain in the West. The original controls on power plant emissions of sulfur and, and nitrogen that cause acid rain were mostly for East Coast power plants. But the the 1990 Clean Air Act revisions that uh, Senator Wirth uh, crafted included controls on Western sources, and our work played a role in uh, making the case before the Congress that this was uh, necessary. That is cool. There's a valuable connection between checking. I think it's cool that there was you find things when you search, and so you would find different kinds of rock, and you wouldn't have known that beforehand, and then it gave you direct experimentation to do, to compare them. It's like a exactly. cool find. Exactly. It's sort of like if someone is searching architecturally in the Middle East or somewhere, and they find tombs or something underneath, and you can only find what you're looking for, and then you might find some cool stuff. Yep, yep. That's neat. That's cool. Certain kinds of rock absorb acidity and others do not. Now, a lot of what you examine is macroecological trends. Is there any broad trends that are occurring at this time? Are there any specific ones you like to focus on? Yeah. Well, first, maybe it would help to tell your listeners what macroecological means. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, there's a 
ecology, subfield of ecology that we call macroecology. And it's the study of broad patterns on the landscape. For example, if you go to a forest, um, you might uh, be interested in the abundance of the different species. If I go to a tropical forest and let's say it's a um, quarter of a square mile in area, and I, take, I carve out a patch, a plot, quarter of a square mile, and I ask how many species are in that plot? How many species of trees or insects or birds? Uh, let's take trees because they sit still. And they're easier to, <laughs> to measure. Uh, I might have uh, several hundred species of trees on that quarter square mile. Now, if I look at each species, I can count how many individuals are in that species. And if I look across all the two or 300 species, I get a long list of numbers, the abundances of each species. And they form what um, ecologists would call the abundance distribution. There'll be a lot of, there'll be some species that are very rare with only one or two individuals. And some of them will be very common and some of them will be in between, um, intermediate abundance. Uh, altogether, there might be several hundred thousand trees, individual trees on that quarter square mile, and they're divided up into several hundred species. So one of the things macroecologists study is the distribution of abundance across the species. Uh, and different ecosystems exhibit, potentially could exhibit very different behavior, very different patterns of abundance. But it's interesting to know whether a forest in the tropics has the same abundance distribution as a forest in the Arctic, in, uh, um, in say in Northern Canada. Um, completely different ecosystem, but it's still a forest. Well, what do they have in common? And it's the patterns that are shared across different habitats that are of most interest to macroecologists. Another pattern is called the species area relationship. And it, it's as follows. If I look at that quarter square mile, I might have, let's say 200 species of trees. Now let's go to a twice as big area of forest, half a square mile mm -hmm. or four times as big, one square mile. How many more species will I see when I sample the bigger area? Now, if you double the area, you do not see twice as many species, but you will see more than in the original smaller patch. The half square mile will have more species than the quarter square mile, but not twice as many. So how does this number of species you count increase as you look at bigger and bigger areas. That's called the species area relationship. And that's also something macroecologists study. Now there's a third thing, which is how does the species that you see in one quarter square mile differ from the species you see in another quarter square mile that's 10 miles away? Um, Ecologists call that beta diversity. You don't have to worry about the name, but it's basically a measure of how similar are systems further and further apart from each other. Do they, do they all look the same or do they um, differ tremendously as you move away from the original site and look at other sites? Um, now what among the changes that have occurred on the landscape over um, the last hundred years, really, as a result of human land use uh, disturbance, uh, people uh, plowing up land for agriculture and building shopping malls and doing all the things that people do to what used to be natural landscapes. All of these things that people have done have done something very interesting. They've created 
uh, changes in macroecological patterns that are very distinct. Um, one of them is that you don't see a very big difference in the number of species on a small patch, but you see more similarity across patches that are further away from each other. In other words, we're homogenizing the distribution. We've caused many species to go extinct. We've lost them, but we've also mixed the species that are left so that they all, they, you see the same species when you walk 10 miles away from a given spot. 100 or 200 years ago, you would see different species if you walk 10 miles away. Now you see the same species. It's like we stirred the whole landscape, the whole of the Amazon and mixed everything up so that everything is the same. The, the, there's a loss of to total number of species. There's more similarity uh, between different patches, no matter how far apart you get them. And there's about the same number on any small patch. And the reason is that we've mixed species. So we've brought new species in to replace the extinct ones. These are called invasive species, but we've homogenized the whole uh, landscape to create overall less diversity. So fewer species, uh, pretty much the same number on small scales, but differing uh, 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 level of similarity when you move a distance over the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, that, it's a complicated idea, but it's, um, it's as if we started with a very uh, um, differentiated pattern and we mixed it, we stirred it up so that everything was everywhere now. Um, and instead of uh, distinctness, it's a little bit like what goes on in human society, if you, um, as a result of transportation and um, the movement of people, we've homogenized culture across mm -hmm. the earth. Uh, we don't have distinct isolated groups. The result of that is many languages have gone extinct. We used to have about 10,000 languages, give or take, on earth, and now we have about 6,000. We've lost about 4,000 because of the extinction of local cultures that uh, uh, revolved around a particular unique language. So we've um, made the earth look more similar wherever you go. You'll see a McDonald's where anywhere you go on earth practically, um, but we've also lost a lot of the unique characteristics of local cultures. So very similar thing has happened with wild species and human culture. I've always had many thoughts on this topic because I like variety and distinctness. And as it goes away, I notice it's more quote comfortable, let's say in some ways, but it takes out all the things that I find to be interesting when there is variation. And is this at all connected with my channel? Uh, long ago, it used to be called Armentropy, which is my name, and then Entropy. Is this connected to the principle of maximum entropy? And <laughs> um, yes and no. Um, the, the 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 entropy principle comes from information theory, which was a the field of knowledge that originated with Claude Shannon in the nineteen forties and is really the, um, uh, a good, um, it, it played a huge role in uh, the development of computers and uh, software and programming languages and so on. It's also related to code breaking. And what the principle of maximum entropy says is that when you want to infer something from incomplete knowledge, there's a rule you can apply that guarantees that you'll have reached the least biased inference. Let me explain how it works. Um, 
the let's suppose you want to know the distribution of abundances of trees in a forest mm -hmm. and you only know two things you know the number of species in that forest and you know the total number of individuals so you know how many types there are and you know the total number of entities and now what should you as what can you infer about the likely distribution of abundances over those species and shannon information theory along with the work of somebody named edwin james back in the 1950s came up with a rule called, it's called the maximum entropy uh, principle and it allows you from that very incomplete information from sparse data from a good deal of ignorance it allows you to make the most sensible inference possible the one that assures you that you haven't made unwarranted assumptions about the data and the that's the information entropy principle that we've been using to help construct theory to explain all of these macroecological patterns. So it's a little different from what a lot of people would think of when they hear about entropy in the second law of thermodynamics, which very, very roughly says that um, over time, systems become more disordered. Uh, you, uh, things get yeah. more random over time. Um, mm. if, if you add a drop of ink to a glass of water, initially you have lots of water with a little tiny drop of ink sitting on it. But if you wait, just random motion, Brownian motion and wind and stirring lead to a uniform distribution of that ink throughout the water. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes uh, used to illustrate the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, that if you start out with a glass of water that's got a stirred ink in it, and it's all a uniform sort of light purple from the ink and the water all mixed together, it will never spontaneously rearrange itself into a tiny drop of ink. Uh, in the middle of pure water. Things go from ordered to disordered, not from stirred or disordered, back to ordered on their own. If you want to get back to that drop of ink, you'd have to put an enormous amount of energy into the system and maybe filter it or do something that uh, attracts all the ink molecules into a single spot. Um, it'd be very difficult to do. Uh, and it takes energy. But if you leave a system to its own devices, it will look more and more stirred over time. So you could say that um, the stirring of cultures and the stirring of life on Earth is the result of the second law of, of thermodynamics, but that would be complete nonsense. It, it actually it would have nothing to do with the second law of thermodynamics. In fact, it took a lot of energy to cause the blurring of cultures and the stirring. It took the energy to fly people from one culture to another and to send um, uh, uh, communication signals that result in the homogenization of culture. And the same with ecosystems. It um, takes a lot of energy to cut down the trees in a forest. And it, it would be a misuse of thermodynamics to say, that um, the changes in the patterns of biodiversity on Earth are the result of the second law. So there's two different entropy principles. The second law of thermodynamics, it has nothing to do with this directly. But then there's the concept of information entropy, the Shannon concept, which we think has a great deal to do with it in the sense that from that information entropy principle, you can construct theory that explains what we're seeing. One thing that came to my mind earlier, you had mentioned with entropy code breaking. Did you see 
in the past week there was a code from like 50 years ago that was cracked i saw the zodiac code yeah, yeah. i saw i saw that yeah um and it was wild because he had arranged the symbols in a you know rows just like you would if you were writing you know a document but to read it you have to read the diagonals <laughs> and the diagonal shift you can't just go uh, you know net, diagonal to next diagonal to next one it's it's a complicated rule that he had cooked up for for doing this it was um diabolical and not just ah. his actions but his his code uh construction this is true something that goes that long that's very interesting yeah that's amazing that, that they were able to crack it it's right using applications and whatnot. It's kind of a cool feature. Yeah, yeah. the unknowing of something. I always look at, um, back to entropy, like uh, disorder and chaos. I always found them more interesting in total when we have things that are so put together and organized. Like if we reduce the species down, but they're everywhere, it's not as interesting to me. And I, I don't know if it's as good for the earth. Is it bad for the earth if we have way less species and they're everywhere, but they all get along, but there's very little of them. Yep. yep. It, 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 if nothing else, it reduces the pleasure that we get from um, taking a walk through forests and visiting uh, foreign locations. It's, um, it's, it's annoying sometimes when I, I've done a lot of bird watching in countries all over the world and you know to go um, somewhere and find the same species that we can see back home uh, is annoying but much more important than that uh, the um, basis for agriculture and um, and human well-being um, is dependent upon diversity at all these different scales. And when we uh, cause species to go extinct and we lose biological diversity, what we're doing is, uh, in a sense, making life less rich and possible, both in an aesthetic sense, but then also in an economic and material sense, because Biological diversity is critical to providing um, the benefits that we derive from um, nature. Good ex recent example: uh, these um, uh, giant Asian hornets that um, are showing up in the U.S. Uh, they didn't used to be here, but we're getting them, and they're killing our bees that do pollination for our farmers. Mm -hmm. So we're losing the um, uh, pollination benefits of our local uh, insects because foreign insects are killing the um, domestic ones and not providing the same pollination benefit. Um, a good fraction of all the food we eat has to be pollinated by bees and other uh, insects and birds that carry it. And, uh, carry out uh, pollination. So if we lose the pollinators, we lose food supply. And you can directly attribute some of the um, loss of pollination services to the um, invasive insects that are damaging them. And we've, um, this is a very serious problem, not just in the US, around the world. We lose all the bees, we are done. We are done for. Well, yeah, I mean, it, food production will be impacted and uh, the variety of foods we have access to will decrease. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, all by itself, we could probably figure out how to get around that. But on top of it, though, we've got climate change, which is altering the availability of water to irrigate our crops. Uh, causing much longer droughts that um, are going to impair food production. Uh, we've got toxic substances 
uh, pesticides building up in the food chain and in, in our crops that are toxifying us. Uh, we have so many problems um, looming uh, on the horizon for food production that I really worry how civilization will feed itself 40 years from now, even 20 years from now, um, and it, possibly even in the next few years if the current drought we're experiencing in the southwestern U.S. continues. Right. You've talked about a few of the tipping points that we are heading towards or may have already passed. What are some examples where humans have heavily disturbed the Earth's homeostasis? Hmm. Uh, do your readers know what you mean by homeostasis? <laughs> they, I will say most likely, but... Well, let, uh, let's talk about homeostasis because mm -hmm. it's, it's a complicated idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, basically what it means is things don't change much. The mm -hmm. uh, homeostatic system is resilient against right. external forces. So it doesn't bounce back and forth just because uh, it's being disturbed by different right. uh, forces. Um, and the homeostasis of Earth is kind of a controversial idea. If, if you talk to geologists, they don't talk that way. The Earth is always changing on right. their time scale. Uh, we're, we want the same amount of lettuce to be produced next year as this year, maybe 3% more because of population uh, right. growth and uh, export. But um, the we would like things to be the same from year to year, but they never have been and never will be. Question is, are we, is the homeostasis so disrupted by human activity that we can cause the collapse of everything? And that's really the concern that um, uh, my, my view is that we've, we expect too much if we expect every year to be the same as every other year. And that as a civilization, we have to learn how to be more flexible and adjust from year to year to natural changes. If we try to engineer Earth in such a way that every year we get the same thing, the same amount of lettuce and the, uh, we um, you know, get all the Almonds. same production of goods and services and food and everything, uh, we are going to end up uh, creating a system that becomes very unstable. The more you try to stabilize everything to make every year look the same as every other year, my opinion is that you're more likely in the long run to actually end up with more change and more damage. So we should learn how to roll with the punches and accept variability from year to year, but we do want to prevent collapse. And that's really the thing that the focus should be on, not homeostasis in the narrow sense of every year is the same as every other year, but preventing collapse. And this requires major changes in the way society works. In uh, population, we have to, um, we probably have a population size that exceeds a threshold for preventing collapse. And we should be working over the long run to bring population levels down. We should certainly be uh, reducing population growth. And the best way to do that right now, um, is the single best thing that you could do is make sure that every woman around the world has free access to contraception. Um, there are a hundred, several hundred million women in the world, especially in um, sub-Saharan Africa, who lack access to contraception. And they want it. It's a violation of their human rights to not make it available. And uh, so I think the single most important first step globally in dealing with population 
is to um, ensure access to contraception. In the United States, uh, the big problem is the fact that every new baby born to a average or wealthier than average American is using a disproportionate amount of the world's resources. And so reducing population growth in among the wealthy in the rich nations is very important and probably as a uh, single most important first thing we could do is reduce population growth amongst uh, the wealthy and the rich nations and give every woman everywhere worldwide free access to contraception. Those two steps together um, would do a great deal to uh, help prevent collapse. The second thing that besides population is per capita consumption. And here the problem rests squarely on the shoulders of the wealthy nations who are consuming more than the earth can tolerate and more energy, more resources of all types and um, uh, even more calories than uh, is necessary for their best health. Um, so reducing consumption amongst the wealthy and reducing population growth amongst the wealthy and providing access so women can choose how many children they want in other parts of the world. Those are the big steps that um, I think we have to make. In addition to that, clearly to deal with climate change, we have to uh, uh, transition from fossil fuels to clean renewable energy, solar and wind as quickly as possible. And I think that can be done over the next 30 years. Um, and, and it seems like there's increasing acceptance of this idea uh, around the world. So um, I think um, climate change problem is actually among the easier to deal with. I think a much harder problem is dealing with consumption and population. That's a nice uplifting end of that that we didn't think of that climate change might not be, but actually the other ones are more relevant to us. That's a key point of it. Uh, focusing on the segments that use the most because it's disproportionate their impacts on the earth versus some people barely have an impact on the earth in poorer countries yeah yeah the thing is we want people in poorer countries to have a higher standard of living right we want to bring we should it's it's morally responsible to work to bring a higher quality of life to uh, poor people around the world. Uh, but to do that and not to give them the right to uh, choose their family size leads to huge problems. So if we respect their human rights and give them the opportunity to choose how big their families will be by making contraception widely available, then it's more possible to bring their standard of living uh, closer to uh, the rest of the world and to bring our standard of living down a little bit, to notch it down because we overconsume, we consume more than is necessary for the good life. And if we could meet in the middle and bring our population down, we have a chance of uh, keeping civilization going for a long, long time. If we don't do those things, I don't see any um, way around the conclusion that civilization will collapse under its own weight. It does seem like it's in that direction. And the youth are powered towards also helping to adjust that if possible, because that's the future Earth for them. This is a valid point. Professor Hart. We have covered a variety of topics. Also, by the way, I want to mention that Professor Blumstein spoke well of you. That will be my last question. Have you guys worked together? And 
do like what work he has done? Uh, yeah, we uh, we met at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab in Colorado. Uh, I had been there for, as I said, 44 years. He arrived about, what was it, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and we became good friends and have uh, uh, we have a paper we've co-authored along with about 30 other scientists that's um, in review at a journal now talking about these very issues of collapse and, and saving civilization. Uh, so we do collaborate and uh, we also, uh, before COVID, used to get together often during the year for uh, socializing. Um, but yeah, uh, Dan is a wonderful guy. He does great work with marmots and uh, behavior and fear. And he's superb at popularizing the science he does. Mm -hmm. Fear is, I, I like to mention that we spoke about that and it's one of the categories I've always been interested in. So like that point you brought up earlier about going towards what you like versus what you think is important, I've always, uh, checked on stuff towards fear because I like that category. Yeah. And, and you're right, where your interest is, that's where it's always like cool versus the other thing. It feels like it's a good thing, but you're not, it's not like a star. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's a fair exactly. point. Exactly. Professor Hart, I would like to thank you for having joined on this episode and bringing this information and knowledge to the people uh, who listen to the show. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. And we are out.